Psychology of the Unconscious by Jung, Part 2, Chapter 4, The Unconscious Origin of the Hero. Prepared by the previous chapters, we approach the personification of the libido in the form of a conqueror, a hero, or a demon. With this, the symbolism leaves the impersonal and neuter realm, which characterizes the astral and meteorological symbol, and takes human form, the figure of a being changing from sorrow to joy, from joy to sorrow, and which, like the sun, sometimes stands in its zenith, sometimes is plunged in darkest night, and arises from this very night to a new splendor. Footnote. Therefore the beautiful name of the sun hero Gilgamesh. Wethrom Mensch. Pain, joy, human being. See Gerson, Gilgamesh epic. And the footnote. Just as the sun, guided by its own internal laws, ascends from morn till noon, and passing beyond the noon descends towards evening, leaving behind its splendor, and then sinks completely into an all-enveloping night, thus, too, does mankind follow their course according to immutable laws, and also sinks after the course is completed into night, in order to rise again in the morning in a new cycle of our children. The symbolic transition from sun to people is easy and practicable. The third and last creation of Miss Miller's also takes this course. She calls this piece Shirwat Topel, a high, 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 a a hypnagogic poem. She gives us the following information about the circumstances surrounding the origin of this fantasy. Quote, After an evening of care and anxiety, I lay down to sleep about half past eleven. I felt excited and unable to sleep, although I was very tired. There was no light in the room. I closed my eyes, and then I had the feeling that something was about to happen. The sensation of a general relaxation came over me, and I remained as passive as possible. Lines appeared before my eyes, sparks and shining spirals, followed by a kaleidoscopic review of recent trivial occurrences. End quote. The reader will regret with me that we cannot know the reason for her cares and anxieties. It would have been of great importance for what follows to have information to have information on this point. This gap in our knowledge is more to be deplored because, between the first poem in 1898 and the time of the fantasy here discussed, 1902, four whole year years have passed. All information is lacking regarding this period, during which the great problem surely survived in the unconscious. Perhaps this lack had its advantages in that our interest is not diverted from the universal applicability of the fantasy here produced by symphony, sympathy in regard to the personal fate, fate of the author. Therefore, something is obviated which often prevents the analyst in her daily task from looking away from the tedious toil of detail to the wider relation which reveals each neurotic conflict to be involved with human fate as a whole. The condition depicted by the author here corresponds to such a one as usually precedes an intentional somnambulism. Footnote. Compare here the interesting research of H. Silberer. End footnote. Of int intentional somnambulism, often described by spiritualistic mediums. A certain inclination to listen to these low nocturnal voices must be assumed. Otherwise, such fine and hardly perceptible inner experiences pass up unnoticed. We recognize in this listening a current of the libido leaning inward and beginning to flow towards a still invisible mysterious goal. It seems that the libido has suddenly discovered an object in the depths of the unconscious which powerfully attracts it. The life of people, turned wholly to an external, to the external by nature, does not ordinarily permit such introversion. There must, therefore, be surmised a certain exceptional condition, that is to say, a lack of external objects which compels the individual to seek a substitute for them in their own soul. 
it is however difficult to imagine that this rich world has become too poor to offer an object for the love of human atoms nor can the world and its objects be held accountable for this lack it offers boundless opportunities for everyone it is rather the incapacity to love which robs people of their possibilities this world is empty to people alone to the person alone who does not understand how to direct their libido towards objects and to render them alive and beautiful for themselves for oneself for beauty does not indeed lie in things but in feelings in the feelings that we give to them that which compels us to create a substitute for ourselves is not the external lack of objects but our incapacity to lovingly include a thing outside of ourselves certainly the difficulties of the condition of life and the adversities of the struggle for existence may oppress us yet even adverse external situations will not hinder the giving out of libido on the contrary they may spur us to the greater exertions whereby we bring our whole libido into reality real difficulties will never be able to force the libido back permanently to such a degree as to give rise for example to a neurosis the complex which is in which is the condition of every neurosis is lacking the resistance which opposes its unwillingness to the will alone has the power to produce that pathogenic introversion which is the starting point of every psychogenic disturbance the resistance against loving produces the inability to love just as the normal libido is comparable to a steady stream which pours its waters broadly into the world of reality so the resistance dynamically considered is comparable not so much to a rock rearing up in the riverbed which is flowed over or surrounded by the stream as to a backward flow toward the source part of the soul desires the outer object another part however harks back to the subjective world where the airy and fragile fantasies palaces of fantasy beckon one can assume the dualism of the human will for which bluler from the psychiatric point of view has coined the term ambitendency footnote see bluler psychiatro neutral end of footnote so ambitendency as something generally present bearing in mind that even the most primitive motor impulse is in a position as for example in the act of extension the flexor muscles also become innervated this normal ambitendency however never leads to an inhibition or prevention of the intended act but is the indispensable preliminary requirement for its perfection and coordination for a resistance disturbing to this act to arise from this harmony of finely attuned opposition an abnormal plus or minus would be needed on one or the other side the resistance originates from this added third this applies also to the duality of the will from which so many difficulties arise for people the abnormal third frees the pair of opposites which are normally most intimately united and causes their manifestations in the form of separate tendencies it is only thus that they become willingness and unwillingness which interfere with each other but the bahag dita says quote, be thou free of the pairs of opposites Com uh, footnote compare the exhortation by krishna to the irresolute arujara and baghdad vita quote, but thou be free of the pair of opposites and a footnote the harmony thus becomes disharmony it cannot be my task here to investigate hence the unknown third arises and what it is taken as the root in the ca case of our patient the nuclear complex freud reveals itself as the incest problem the sexual libido regressing to the parents appears as the incest tendency the reason this path is so easily traveled is due to the enormous indolence of people which will relinquish no object of the past but will hold its its fast hold it fast forever the quote sacrilegious backward grasp unquote of which nietzsche speaks reveals itself stripped of its incest covering as an original passive arrest of the libido 
in its first object of childhood. This indolence is also a passion, as La Rochefoucauld has brilliantly expressed it. Quote, of all passions, that which is least known to ourselves is indolence. It is the most ardent and malignant of them all, although its violence may be insensible, and the injury it causes may be hidden. If we will consider its power attentively, we will see that it makes itself, upon all occasion, mistress of our sentiments, of our interest, of our pleasure. It is the anchor which has the power to arrest the largest vessel. It is a calm more dangerous to the most important affairs that rocks and the worst that rocks and the worst tempest. The repose of indolence is a secret charm of the soul which suddenly stops the most ardent pursuits and the firmest resolutions, finally to give the true idea of this passion. One must say that indolence is like a beatitude of the soul which consoles it for all its losses and takes the place of all its possessions. End quote. This dangerous passion, belonging above all others to primitive people, appears under the hazardous mask of the incest symbol, from which the incest fear must drive us away, and which must be conquered in the first place under the image of the terrible mother. See the following chapter, says the footnote. It is the mother of innumerable evils, not the least of which are neurotic troubles, for especially from the fogs of the arrested remnants of the libido arise the harmful phasma, phantasmagoria, which so, vile, so veil reality that adaptation becomes almost impossible. However, we will not investigate any further into this place, in this place the foundations of the incest fantasies. The preliminary su suggestion of my purely psychologic conception of incest problem may suffice. We are here only concerned with the question whether resistance, which leads to introversion in our author, signifies a conscious external difficulty or not. If it were an external difficulty, then indeed the libido would be violently dammed back and would produce a flood of fantasies, which can best be des designated as schemes, that is to say, plans as to how the obstacles could be overcome. This would be very concrete ideas of reality which seek to pave the way for solutions. It would be a strenuous meditation, indeed, which would be more likely to lead to anything rather than to a hypnogenic poem. The passive condition depicted above is in no way fits in with the real external obstacle, but precisely through its passive submission, submission it indicates a tendency which doubtless scorns real solutions and prefers fantastic substitutes. Ultimately and essentially we are therefore dealing with an internal conflict, perhaps after the manner of those earlier conflicts which led to the first two unconscious creations. We therefore are forced to conclude that the external object cannot be loved because a predominant amount of libido prefers a fantas fantastic object which must be brought up from the depths of the unconscious as a compensation for the missing reality. The visionary phenomena produced in the first stages of introversion are grouped among the well-known phenomena of hypnogenic vision. They form, as I explained in an earlier paper, the foundation of the true visions of the symbolic auto-relevations of the libido, as we now express it. Miss Miller continues, quote, Then I had the impression of some communication was immediately impend that, that some communication was immediately impending. It seemed to me as if they were re-echoed in me the words, Speak, O Lord, for thy servant listens. Open thou mine ears. Unquote. This passage very clearly describes the intention. The expression communication is even a current term in spiritualistic circles. The biblical words contain a clear invocation or prayer, that is to say a wish, libido, directed towards divinity, the unconscious complex. The prayer refers to Samuel 1.3, where Samuel a night, at night was three times called by God, but believed it was Eli calling until the latter informed him that it was God himself who spoke and that he must answer if his name was called again. Speak, O Lord, for thy servant hears. The dreamer uses these words really in a reverse sense, namely in order to produce God with them 
With that, she directs her desires, her libido, into the depths of her unconscious. We know that, although individuals are widely separated by the differences in the contents of their consciousness, they are closely alike in their unconscious psychology. It is a significant impression for one working in practical psychoanalysis that one realizes how uniform are the typical unconscious complexes. The differences first arise from the individualization. This fact gives to an essential proportion of the Schopenhauer and Hartman philosophies of a deep psychologic justification. Footnote. Also the related doctrine of the Upanishad. End of footnote. The very evident uniformity of the unconscious mechanism serves as a psychologic foundation for these philosophical views. The unconscious contains the, un the differentiated remnants of the earlier psychologic functions overcome by the individual differentiation. The reaction and products of the animal psyche are of a generally diffused uniformity and solidarity, which, among people, may be discovered apparently over in, only in traces. People appear as something ex so, sorry. People appear as something extraordinarily individual in contrast with animals. This might be a tremendous delusion because we have the appropriate tendency always to recognize only the difference of things. This is demanded by the psychologic adaptation, which, without the most minute differentiation of the impression, would be absolutely impossible. In opposition to this tendency, we have ever the greater difficulty in recognizing their common relations. In, re in sorry, in in opposition to this tendency, we have ever the greatest difficulty in recognizing in their common relations the things which we have occupied in everyday life. This recognition becomes much easier with things which are more remote from us. For example, it is almost impossible for a European to differentiate the faces of uh, Asian people, although Asian people have just as individual face formations as the Europeans, but the similarity of their strange facial expressions is much more evident to the remote onlooker than their individual differences. But when we live among Asians, then the impression of their uniformity disappears more and more, and finally the Asian becomes individuals also. Individuality, individuality belongs to those conditional actualities which are greatly overrated theoretically on account of their practical significance. It does not belong to those overwhelmingly clear and therefore universal the obstructed general facts upon which a science must primarily be founded. The individual content of consciousness is, therefore, the most unfavorable object imaginable for the psychology because it has veiled the universally valid until it has become unrecognizable. The essence of consciousness is the process of adaptation which takes place in the most minute detail. On the other hand, the unconscious is the generally diffused, which not only binds the individuals among themselves to the race, but also unites them backwards to the peoples of the past in their psychology. Thus the unconscious, surpassing the individual in its generality, is, in the first place, the object of a true psychology, which claims not to be psychophysical. People a person as an individual is a suspicious phenomenon, the right of whose existence from a natural biological standpoint could be seriously contested because from this point of view the individual is only a race atom and has a significance only as a mass constituent. The ethical standpoint, however, gives to the human being an individual tendency separating one from the mass, which, in the course of centuries, led to the development of personality hand in hand, which has developed the hero cult, which led to the modern individualistic cult of personages. The attempts of, of, of rationalistic theology to keep hold of the personal Jesus as the last and most precious remnant of the divinity, which has vanished beyond the power of the imagination, corresponds to this tendency. In this respect, the Roman Catholic Church was more practical because 
She met the general need of the visible, or at least historically believable, hero through the fact that she placed upon the throne of worship a small but clearly perceptible god of the world, namely the Roman Pope, the Pater Paternum, and at the same time the Pontifex Maximus of the invisible upper and inner god. The sensuous demonstrability of God naturally supports the religious process of introversion because the human figure essentially facilitates the transference, for it is not easy to imagine something lovable or venerable in a spiritual being. This tendency everywhere present has been secretly preserved in the rationalistic theology with its Jesus historically ins insisted upon. This does not mean that men loved the visible God. They loved him, not as he is, for he is merely a man, and when the pious wished to love humanity, they could go to their neighbors and their enemies to love them. Mankind wishes to love in God only their ideas, that is to say, the ideas which they project onto God. But they wish to love their unconscious, that is to say, the remnant of humanity in the centuries-old past in all people, namely, the, cro the common property left behind from all development, which is given in all people like the sunshine and the air. But in loving this inheritance, they love that which is common to all. Thus they turn back to the mother of humanity, that is to say, to the spirit of the race, and regain in this way something of the connection of that mysterious and irresistible power which is imparted by the feeling of belonging to the herd. It is the problem of Aetnus, Aetnus, sorry, of Anteus, who presents his gigantic strength only through contact with Mother Earth. This temporary withdrawal into oneself, which, as we have already seen, signifies a regression to the childish bonds to the parent, seems to act favorably with certain limits in its effect upon the psychologic condition of the individual. It is, in general, to be expected that the two fundamental mechanisms of the psychosis, transference, transference and introversion, are to a wide extent extremely appropriate methods of normal reaction against complexes. Transference as a means of escaping from the complex into reality, introversion as a means of detaching oneself from reality through the complex. After we have informed ourselves about the general purpose of prayer, we are prepared to hear more about the vision of our dreamer. After the prayer, quote, the head of the sphinx with an Egyptian head headdress, unquote, appeared only to vanish quickly, here the author was disturbed, so that for, the moment, for, for a moment she awoke. The vision recalled the previously mentioned fantasy of the Egyptian statue, whose rigid gesture is entirely in place here as a phenomenon of so-called functional category. The light stages of hypnosis are designated technically as engrodismo, stiffening. The word sphinx in the whole civilized world signifies the same as riddle, a puzzling creature who proposes riddles like the sphinx of oedipus standing at the portal of his fate like a symbolic proclamation of the inevitable the sphinx is a semi-theomorphic representation of the mother image which may be designated as terrible mother of whom many traces are found in mythology this interpretation is correct for oedipus here the question is opened the objection will be raised that nothing except the word sphinx justifies the illusion of the sphinx of oedipus on account of the lack of subject materials, which in, mis in, in the Miller text are wholly lacking in regard to this vision, an individual interpretation would be excluded. The suggestion of an Egyptian fantasy, part 1, chapter 2, is entirely insufficient to be employed. Therefore, we are compelled, if we wish to venture at all up an understanding of this vision, to direct ourselves, perhaps in all too daring a manner, to the available ethnographic material under the assumption that the unconscious of the present-day person coins its symbols, as was done in the most remote past. Reader's note, this Sphinx thing just comes up, so I haven't missed any of the reading, it just came up, I'm not sure where. Okay, back to where we are in the reading. The Sphinx, in its traditional form, is a half-human, half-animal creature, which we must in part interpret in the way which is that is applicable to such fantastic fantastic products. The reader is direct directed to the deductions in the first part of this volume, where the theomorphic representations of the libido were discussed. This manner of representation is very familiar to the analyst through the dreams and fantasies of neurotics and of normal people. 
The impulse is readily represented as an animal, as a bull, a horse, a dog. One of my patients who had questionable relations with women and who began the treatment with the fear, so to speak, that I would surely forbid him his sexual adventures, dreamed that I, his physician, very skillfully speared to the wall a strange animal, half pig, half crocodile. Dreams swarm with such theomorphic representations of the libido. Mixed beings, such are as in this dream, are not rare. A series of very beautiful illustrations, where especially the lower half of the animal is, was represented theomorphically, has been furnished by Birchlinger. The libido, which was represented theomorphically as in the animal sexuality, which is the repressed state. The history of repression, as we have seen, goes back to the incest problem, where the first motives for moral resistance against sexuality display themselves. The objects of the repressed libido are, in the last degree, the images of father and mother, therefore the theomorphic symbols, insofar as they do not symbolize merely the libido in general, but have a tendency to present father and mother, for example, father represented by the bull, mother by a cow. From these roots, we pointed out earlier, might probably arise the theomorphic attributes of the divinity. In as far as the repressed libido manifests itself under certain conditions as anxiety, there, these animals are generally of a horrible nature. In consciousness, we are attached by all sacred bounds to the mother. In the dream, she pursues us as a terrible animal. The sphinx, mythologically considered, is actually a fear animal, which reveals distinct traits of a mother deriv derivative. In the Oedipus legend, the Sphinx is sent by Hera, who hates Thebes on account of the birth of Bacchus. Because Oedipus conquers the Sphinx, which is nothing but fear of the mother, he must marry Jocasta, his mother, for the throne and the hand of the widowed queen of Thebes belongs to him, who freed the land from the plague of the Sphinx. The genealogy of the Sphinx is rich in allusion to the problem touched upon here. She is the daughter of Echnida, a mixed being, a beautiful maiden above a hideous serpent, serpent below. This double creature corresponds to the picture of the mother, above the human, lovely, and attractive half, below the horrible animal half, converted into a fear animal through the incest prohibition. Echnida is derived from the all-mother, the earth, mother earth, Gaia, whom, with Tartarus, the personified underworld, the place of hero, horrors, brought her forth. Agneda herself is the mother of all terrors, of the Chimera, Scylla, Gorgo, and the horrible Cerebus, of the Nemean lion, and of the eagle who devoured the liver of Prometheus. Besides this, she gave birth to a number of dragons. One of her sons is Orthrus, the dog of the monstrous Giron, who was killed by Hercules. With this dog, her son Ichnida, an incestuous intercourse, produced the Sphinx. These materials will suffice to characterize that amount of libido which led to the Sphinx symbol. If, in spite of the lack of subjective material, we may venture to draw an inference from the Sphinx symbol to our author, we must say that the Sphinx represents an original incestuous amount of libido detached from the bond of the mother. Perhaps it is better to postpone this conclusion until we have examined the following visions. After Miss Miller had concentrated herself again, the vision developed further. Quote, Suddenly an Aztec appeared, absolutely clear in every detail. The hands spread open, the large fingers, the head in profile, armored, headdress similar to the feathered ornaments of the American Indian. The whole was somewhat suggestive of Mexican sculpture. Unquote. The ancient Egyptian character of the Sphinx is replaced here by American antiquity by the Aztec. The essential idea is neither Egyptian nor Mexico, for the two could not be interchanged. But it is the subjective factor with which the dreamer produces from her own past. I have frequently observed in the analysis of Americans that certain unconscious complexes, i.e. repressed sexuality, are represented by the symbol of, of a black or an Indian. For example, when a European tells in his dream, then there came a ragged individual for Americans and for those who live in the tropics, 
it is a black person. With the Europeans, it is a vagabond or a criminal. With the Americans, it is a black person or an Indian, which represents the individual's own repressed sexual personality and the one considered inferior. It is also desirable to go into the particulars of this vision, as there are certain things worthy of notice. The feather cap, which naturally comes to consist of eagle's feathers, is a sort of magic charm. The hero assumes at the same time something of the sunlight character of this bird, that he adorns himself with its feathers, just as the courage and strength of the enemy are appropriated in swallowing his heart or taking his scalp. At the same time, the father crest is a crown, which is equivalent to the rays of the sun. The historical importance of the sun identification has been seen in the first part. Footnote. How very important is the coronation and the sun identification is shown not alone from countless old customs, but also from the corresponding ancient metaphors in the religious speech, the wisdom of Solomon. 5.17. Therefore will they... They will, therefore, they will receive a beautiful crown from the Lord, the hand of the Lord. One Peter the five four, feed the flock of God, and when the chief serpent shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. In a church hymn of Allendorf, it is said that the soul, of a soul, the soul is liberated from all care and pain, and in dying it has come to the crown of joy. She stands as a bride and a queen in the glitter of eternal splendor at the sight of the great king, etc. In a hymn by Laricius Laurenti, it is said, also of the soul, the crown is entrusted to the brides because they conquer. In a song by Saucer, we, see, we find the passage, Adorn my coffin with garlands, just as the conquered is adorned. From the, these, those springs of heaven, my soul has attained the eternally green crown, the true glory of victory, coming from the Son of God, God who so cared for me. A quotation from the above-mentioned song of Allendorf is added here, in which we have another complete expression of the primitive psychology of the sun, identification with people, which we meet in the Egyptian song of triumph and the ascending soul. Concerning the soul, continuation of the above passage, quote, it, the soul, sees a clear continent sun. His, the sun's joyful, loving nature now restores it through and through. It is the light in his light. Now, could the child see the father, he feels the great gentle emotion of love. Now he can understand the word of Jesus. He himself, the father, has loved you. An unfathomable sea of benefits, an abyss of eternal waves of blessing of blessings is to close to the enlightened spirit. He beholds the continents of God and knows what signifies the in inheritor of God in light and the co-heir of Christ. The feeble body rests on the earth. It sleeps until Jesus awakens it. Then will the dust become the sun, which now is covered by the dark cavern. Then w shall we come together with all the pious who knows how soon, and will be for eternity with the Lord. Unquote. I have emphasized the significant passages by italics. They speak for themselves, so I need add nothing. End of footnote. A special interest attaches to the hand, which is described as open, and the fingers, which are described as large. It is significant that it is the hand upon which the distinct emphasis falls. One might rather have expected a description of the facial expression. It is well known that the gesture of the hand is significant. Unfortunately, we know nothing about that here. Nevertheless, a parallel fantasy might be mentioned which also puts the emphasis upon hands. A patient in a hypnagogic condition saw his mother painted on a wall, like a painting in a Byzantine church. She held one hand up, wide open, with fingers spread apart. The fingers were very large, swollen into knobs at the ends, each surrounded by a small halo. The immediate association with this picture was the fingers of a frog with sucking discs at the ends. Then the similarity of the penis. The ancient setting of this mother picture is also of importance, especially the hand 
had, in this fantasy, a phallic meaning. This interpretation was confirmed by a further remarkable fantasy of the same patient. He saw something like a quote-unquote skyrocket ascending from his mother's hand, which, at closer survey, became a shining bird with golden wings, a golden pheasant, as it then occurs in his mind. We have seen in the previous chapter that the hand actually has a phallic generative meaning, and that this meaning plays a great part in the production of fire. In connection with this fantasy, there is but one observation to make. Fire was bored with the hand, therefore it comes from the hand. Agni, the fire, was worshipped as a golden-winged bird. Footnote. In order to avoid misunderstanding, I must add that this was absolutely unknown to the patient. End footnote. It is extremely significant that it is the mother's hand. I must deny myself the temptation to enter more deeply into this. Let it be sufficient to have pointed out the possible significance of the hand of the Aztec by means of these parallel hand fantasies. We have mentioned the mother suggestively with the Sphinx. The Aztec taking the place of the Sphinx points through his suggestive hand to parallel fantasies in which the phallic hand really belongs to the mother. Likewise, we encounter an antique setting in parallel fantasies. The sim significance of the antique, which experience has shown to be the symbol for infantile, is confirmed by Miss Miller in this connection in the annotation, annotation to her fantasies. For, she says, quote, In my childhood, I took special interest in the Aztec fragments and in the history of Peru and of the Incas, end quote. Through the two analysis of children, which have been published, we have attained an insight into the child's small world, and we have seen what burning interests and questions secretly surround the parents, and that the parents are, for a long time, the objects of great, the greatest interest. Footnote. The analysis of an 11-year-old girl also confirms this. I gave a report of this in the I Congrès international de pédologie 1911 in Brussels. End footnote. We are therefore justified in suspecting that the antique setting applies to the ancients, that is to say, the parents, and that consequently this Aztec has something of a father or mother in himself. Up to this time, indirect hints point only to the mother, which is nothing remarkable in, a, in an American girl, because Americans, as a result of the extreme detachment from the father, are characterized by a most enormous mother complex, which again is connected with that especial social position of women in the United States. This position brings about a special masculinity among capable women, which easily makes possible the symbolism, the symbolizing into a masculine figure. Footnote. The identity of the divine hero with the mystic is not to be doubted. In a prayer written on the papyrus to Hermes, it is said, U gara egar kai egara u tu aun aun onama imon kai to imon son egar gar emai tor aitholon su, which is for thou art I and I am thou. My name is thy name is mine and mine is thine, for I am thy image. From Kenyan Greek papyrus in the British. Museum, cited by Dietrich. The hero as image of the libido is strikingly illustrated in the head of Dionysus at Leiden, where the hair rises like flame over the head. He is like a flame. Quote, the, thy savior will be thy a flame. Firmic, firmic, end quote, firmicus maternus acquaints us with the fact that the god was saluted as bridegroom and young light. He transmits the corrupt Greek sentence, de nun fe kaire nun fe neon fus, which he contrasts the corruption, the Christian corruption, nunum apad te lumen est nec est aliquis qui sponsus mereratur audire, unum lunum, lunum est unus sponsus. Nominum horam gratiam Christus accepted. Today Christ is still our hero and the bridegroom of the soul. These attributes will be confirmed in regard to Ms. Miller's, Ms. Miller's hero in what follows. End of footnote. After this vision, Ms. Miller felt that the name formed itself bit by bit, 
which seemed to belong to this Aztec, quote, the son of an Inca of Peru, unquote. The name is Chi Juan Topil. As the author intimated, something similar to this belonged to her childish reminiscence. The act of naming is, like baptism, something exceedingly important for the creation of a personality, because since olden times, a magic power has been attributed to the name, for which, for example, the spirit of the dead can be conjured. To know the name of anyone means, in mythology, to have power over that one. As a well-known example, I mentioned the fairy tale of Rapunzel. Oh, sorry, of Rumpelstiltskin. In an Egyptian myth, Isis robs the sun god Re permanently of his power by compelling him to tell her his real name. Therefore, to a given name means a given power. Therefore, to give a name means to give a power invested with a definite personality. Footnote. The giving of a name is therefore of significance in the so-called spiritual manifestations. See my paper, Occult Phenomenon. And a footnote. The author observes in regard to the name itself that it reminded her very much of the impressive name Popocatepe a name which belongs to an unforgettable school memory and to the greatest indignation of the patient very often emerges in an analysis in a dream or fantasy and brings with it the same old joke which one heard in school one told oneself and later again forgot although one might hesitate to consider this unhallowed joke as of psychologic importance still one must inquire for the reason of its being one must put also as a counter question why it is always Potosa, Potocatepetl, and not the neighboring Iztaki Hult, or even the higher or just as clear Orizabara, Orizaba. The last has certainly the more beautiful and more easily pronounced name. Potocapetel is impressive because it, of its anima poetic name. In English, the word is to pop, popcorn, which is here considered an anamopoetzi. In German, the words are hinterbombmern, pumpernickel, bomb, pathart, leput, or flaxus. The frequent German word popo, podex, does not indeed exist in English, but flatus is designated as to pop in childish speak. The act of defecation is often design, des, designa, designated as to pop. A joking name for the posterior part is the bum. Poop also means the rear end of a ship. In French, pouf is monopoetic. Pouffer, blazen to explode. La poupe, the rear end of the ship. La, le poupard, the baby in arms. La poupée is a doll. Poupon is the pet name of a chubby-faced child. In Dutch, pop. In German, puppy, in Latin, puppies is doll. In Platus, however, it is also joking, jokingly for the posterior part of the body. Pupus means child. Pupule, girl, little dolly. The Greek word popuze za designates a crackling, snapping, or blowing sound. It is used of kissing. By Theocritus, also, of the associated noise of a flute blowing, the etymologic parallels show a remarkable relationship between the part of the body in question and the child. This relationship we will mention here, only to let it drop at once, as this question we will we'll claim our attention later. One of my patients in his childhood had always connected the act of defecation with the fantasy that his posterior was a volcano, and a violent eruption took place, exploding of gases and gushing forth of lava. The terms for this elemental occurrence of nature are originally not at all poetical, one thinks, for example, of a beautiful phenomenon of the meteor, which the German language most unpoetically calls Sternschnappi, or the smoldering wick of a star. Certain South American Indians call the shooting star the urine of the star. According to the principle of the least resistance, expressions are taken from the nearest source available. For example, the transference of the metonymic expression of urination is Schiffen's to rain. Now, it seems to be very obscure why the mystical figure of Chi Wana Topel, whom Miss Miller, in a note, compares to the control spirit of the spiritualistic medium, is found in such a disreputable neighborhood with his nature or name, 
was brought into relation with this particular part of the body. Footnote to the spiritualistic medium, the ancient recognized this demon as unopodos, the companion and the follower. End of footnote. In order to understand this possibility, we must realize that when we produce from the unconscious, the first to be brought forth is the infantile material long lost in memory. One must, therefore, take the point of view of that time in which this infantile material was still on the surface. If now a much honored object is related to the in the unconscious to the anus, then one must conclude that something of a high valuation was expressed thereby. The question is only whether this corresponds to the psychology of the child. Before we enter upon this question, it must be stated that the anal region is very closely connected with veneration. One thinks of the traditional theses of the great mogul. An oriental tale has this has the same to say of Christian knights who anointed themselves with the excrement of the Pope and cardinals in order to make themselves more formidable. A patient who was characterized by a special veneration for her father has had a fantasy that she saw her father sitting upon the toilet in a dignified manner and people going past gre greeting him effusively. Put note, a parallel to these fantasies are the well-known interpretation of the Stella Petri of the Pope. End of footnote. The association, the association of anal relations by no means excludes high valuation or esteem, as is shown by these examples, as, and as it is easily seen from the intimate connections of feces and gold. Footnote. When Freud calls attention through his analytic research to the connection between excrement, excrement and gold, many ignorant persons found themselves obliged to ridicule in an airy manner this connection. The mythologists think differently about it. De Gubernatis said that the excrement and gold are always associated together. Grimm tells us of the following magic charm. If one wants money in his house the whole year, one must eat lentils in the New Year's Day. This notable connection is explained simply through the psychological fact of the indigestibility of lentils, which appear again in the form of coins. Thus, one becomes a mint. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so, end of footnote. Here, the most, the most worthless comes into the closest relation with the most valuable. This also happens in religious valuations. I discovered at that time, to my great astonishment, that a young patient, very religiously trained, represented in a dream the crucified on the bottom of the blue flowing chamber pot, namely in the form of excrements. The contrast is so enormous that one must assume that the valuations of childhood must indeed be very different from ours. This is actually the truth. Children bring to the act of defecation and the products of this an esteem and interest. Footnote. A, a French father who naturally disagreed with me in regard to this interest in his child mentioned nevertheless that when the child speaks of coco, he always adds lit, and he means coco a li, coco, caca au li. Uh, um, so caca pooping only in the bed. Okay, end of footnote. So uh, it was this esteem and interest, which later on is a pos is possible only in the hypochondriac. We do not comprehend this interest until we learn that the child very early connects with it a theory of propagation. The libido afflux probably accounts for the enormous interest in this act. The child sees that this is the way in which something is produced, in which something comes out. The same child whom I reported in the little brochure Uber Kontrakt der Kinderlichen Sili, and who had a well-developed anal theory of birth, like little Hans, whom Freud had made, had made known to us, later contracted a habit of staying a long time on the toilet. Once the father grew impatient, went to the toilet and, call, and called, do come out of there. What are you making? Whereupon the child, the answer came from within, a little wagon and two ponies. <laughs> the child was making a little wagon and two ponies, that is to say, things which at the same time she especially wished for. In this way, one can make what the one wishes, and the thing made is the thing wished for. The, ch the child wishes earnestly for a doll or at heart for a real child. That is, the child practiced in his future biological act, and in this way, in which everything is general, is produced, he made the doll. Footnote, I refer to the previous etymologic connection, and footnote, 
himself as representative of the child or of the thing wished for in general. From a patient, I have learned a parallel fantasy of her childhood. In the toilet, there was a crevice in the wall. She fantasized that from this crevice, a fairy would come out and the present and present her with everything for which she wished. The locus is known to be the place of dreams, where much was wished for and created, which a lady, which lady would not would no longer be suspected of having this place of origin. A pathological fantasy in place here is told to us by Lombroso concerning two insane artists. They created or produced the world by making it come forth from the rectum, just as the eggs of birds originate in the egg canal. One of these two artists was endowed with a true artistic sense. He painted a picture in which he was just in the act of creation. The world came forth from his anus. The membrane was in full erection. He was naked, surrounded by women, and with all insignia of his power. The excrements is in a certain sense, the thing wished for, and on that account it receives the corresponding valuation. When I first understood this connection, an observation made long ago, and which disturbed me greatly because I never rightly understood it, it became clear to me. It concerned an educated parent, patient who, under very tragic circumstances, had to be separated from her husband and child and was brought into the insane asylum. She exhibited a typical apathy, apathy and slovenliness, which was considered as affect mental de deterioration. Even at that time, I doubted this deterioration and was inclined to regard it as a secondary adjustment. I took a special pains to ascertain how I could discover the existence of the effect of this case. Finally, after more than three hours' hard work, I succeeded in finding a train of thought which suddenly brought the patient into a completely adequate and therefore strongly emotional state. At this moment, the effect of connection with her was completely reestablished. That happened in the forenoon. When I returned at the appointed time in the evening to the ward to see her, she had, for my reception, smeared herself from head to foot with excrement and cried laugh laughingly, Do I please you? She had never done that before, and it was plainly destined for me. Destined for me, the impression which I received was one of a personal affront, and as a result of this, I was convinced for years after of the effective deterioration of such cases. Now we understand this act as an infantile ceremony of welcoming or a declaration of love. The origin of Chiwantopo, that is to say, an unconscious personality, therefore means in the sense of a previous explanation, I make, produce, invent him myself, unquote. It is a sort of human creation or birth by the anal route. The first people were, were made from excre excrement, potter's clay, um, potter's earth or clay, the Latin lutum, which really means moistened earth, also has the transferred meaning of dirt. In Plato's, it is even, there, it is an even uh, it is even a term of abuse, something like you scum. The birth from the anus also remind us, reminds us of the motive of throwing behind oneself. A well-known example is the oracular command, which Diocletian and Thyrea, who were the only survivors of that great flood, received. They were to throw behind themselves the bones of the great mother. They then threw behind them stones from which mankind sprang. According to a tradition, the dacti, in a similar manner, sprang from dust, which the nymph Ancaeli threw behind her. There is also a humorous significance attached to the anal products. The excrements are often considered in popular humor as a monument or memorial, which plays a special part in regard to the criminal in the form of grumos merde. Every day, I'm sorry, everyone knows the humorous story of the man who, led by the spirit through a labyrinthian passage to a hidden treasure, after he shed all his pieces of clothing, deposited excrement as a last guide on his road. It is a more distinct past, in a more distinct past, a sign of this kind possessed as great a significance as the dung of animals to indicate the direction to take. Simple monuments, quote, little stone figures, have taken the place of this per perishable mark. It is noteworthy that Miss Miller quotes another case 
where a name suddenly obstructed itself, parallel to the emerging to into consciousness of Chippewontepel, namely, Ahamarama, with feeling that it dealt with something Assyrian. Footnote, here again is the connection with antiquity, the infantile past. As a possible source of this, there occurred to her Asurbama, who made cuneiform blocks. Footnote, the fact is unknown to me. It might be possible that in some way the name of the legendary man who invented the cuneiform characters had been preserved, as for example, Sin Lik Kyo Ninimi, as the poet of the Gilgamesh epic. But I have not succeeded in finding anything of that sort. However, Ashur, Ashurban Napu, Pul, or Asurban Nepal has left behind that marvelous cuneiform library, which was excavated in Kujunstik. Perhaps the Asur Ubama has something to do with his name. Further, there comes into the consideration the name of Aholi ah, ah, Baman, which we have met in part one. The word ah, Ahama Rama betrays equally some connection with Anun and Aholi Bama, whose daughters of those daughters of Cain, with a sinful passion for the sons of God. This possibility hints at Chiwatopal as the longed for son of God. Did Byron think of the two sister whores, Ohula and Ohule Liba? And a footnote. So we were at footnote twenty five. Let's find it in the text. Starting the sentence again. As a possible source of this, there occurred to her Asur Abama, who made cuneiform bricks. Those imperishable documents made from clay, the monuments of the most ancient history. If it were not emphasized that the bricks were cuneiform, then it might mean ambiguously wedge-shaped bricks, which is more suggestive of our interpretation than that of, than that of the author. Miss Miller remarks that beside the name Asur, Asurabama, she also thought of Ahus, uh, uh, Aha. Suras or uh, uh, Asveras. This fantasy leads to a very different aspect of the problem of the unconscious personality. While the previous material portrays to us something of the infantile theory of creation, this fantasy opens up a vista into the dynamics of the unconscious creation of personality. Uh, ha, uh, ahas there is, as is well known, the wandering Jew. He is characterized by endless and restless wanderings until the end of the world. The fact that the author had thought of this particular name justifies us in following this trail. The legend of Ahasver, the first literary trace of which belongs to the 13th century, seems to be of Occidental origin and belongs to those ideas which possess indestructible vital energy. The figure of the wandering Jew has undergone more literary elaboration than the figure of Faust, and nearly all of this work belongs to the last century. If the figure is not called a Hasver, still there is, still it is there under another name, perhaps of Count Saint Germain, the mysterious Rosicrucian, whose immortality was assured, and whose temporary res res residence, the land was equally known. Footnote. The race does not part with its wandering sun heroes. Thus, it was related to Cag Cagliostro that he once drove at the same time four white horses out of a city from all the gates simultaneously at Helios. End of footnote. Although the stories about a Hasveder cannot be tracked back to earlier than the 13th century, the oral tradition can reach back considerably further, and it is not an impossibility that a bridge to the Orient exists. There is a parallel figure in Chidr, or Al-Chidir, the ever-youthful Chidhir, elaborated in song by Rukert. The legend is purely Islamic. The particular feature, however, is that Chidhir is not only a saint, but in surfic cir cir circles, or mysticism, rises even to divine significance in view of the severe monotheism of Islam, 
One is inclined to think of Chidhir as pre-Islamic Arabic divinity who had hardly be, who would hardly be officially recognized by the new religion, but who may have been tolerated on political grounds. But there is nothing to prove that. The first traces of Chidhir are found in the commentaries on the Quran, Bhutshari and Tabari, and in a commentary to a noteworthy passage of the 18th surah of the Quran. The 18th surah is entitled The Cave, that is, after the cave of the seven sleepers, who, according to the legend, slept there for 309 years and thus escaped persecution and awoke in a new era. Their legend is recounted in the 18th surah. The diver's reflections were associated with it. The wish fulfillment idea of the legend is very clear. The mystic material for it is the immutable model of the sun's course. The sun sets periodically, but does not die. It hides in the womb of the sea or in a subterranean cave. Footnote, Agni, the fire, also hides himself at times in a cavern. Therefore, he must be brought forth again by generation from the cavity of the female wood. End of footnote. And in the morning he is born again. The language in which this astro astronomic occurrence is clothed in one of clear symbolism. The sun returns into the mother's womb, and after some time is born again. Of course, this event is properly an incestuous act, of which in mythology clear traces still retain, not the least of which is the circumstances that the dying and the resurrected gods are the lovers of their own mothers, or have generated themselves through their own mothers. Christ, as God becoming flesh, has generated himself through Mary. Mithra has done the same. These gods are unmistakable sun gods, for the sun also does this in order to again renew himself. Naturally, it is not to be assumed that astronomy came first and these conceptions of God afterwards. The process was, as always, inverted. It is even true that primitive magic charms of rebirth, baptism, superstition, superstitious usage of all sorts concerning curing the, the, concerning the cure for the sick, etc., were projected onto the heavens. These youths were born from the cave, the womb of Mother Earth, like the sun gods in a new era, and this was the way they vanquished death. In this far, they were immortal. It is now interesting to see how the Quran comes, after a long ethical contemplations in the course of the same surah, to the following passage, which is of a special significance for the origin of the Chitra myth. And for this reason, I quote the Quran literally. So we quote, Remember when Moses said to his servant, I will not stop until I reach the confluence of the two seas, or for eighty years I will journey on. But then they reached their confluence, and they forgot their fish, and it took its way to in the sea it took its way in the sea at will. And when they passed on, Moses said to his servant, Bring us our morning meal, for now we have incurred weariness from this our journey. He said, What thinkest thou? When we repaired to the rock for rest, then verily I forgot the fish, and none but Satan made me forget it, so as not to mention it, and it hath taken its way in the sea in a wondrous sort. He said, It is this we were in quest of. And so they both went back, retracing their footsteps. Then found they one of our servants, to whom we had vouchsafed our mercy, and whom we had instructed our knowledge. Moses said to him, Shall I follow thee, that thou teachest me, for guidance, of which thou hast been taught? He said, Verily, thou canst by no means have patience with me, and how canst thou be patient in matters whose meanings thou comprehendest not? End of quote. Moses now accompanies the mysterious servant of God, who does divers things which Moses cannot comprehend, diverse things which Moses cannot comprehend. Finally, the unknown takes leave of Moses and speaks to him as follows, quote, They will ask thee of du, du, du canern, or the two-horned. Say, I will recite to you an account of him. Verily, we establish his powers upon the earth, and we give him a means to accomplish every end. So he follows his way. Until when he reached the setting of the sun, he found it to set in a merry forest, and hard by he found a people. So, footnote on Dukarnin, the two-horned. The two-horned, according to the commentaries, this refers to Alexander the Great, who is 
the Arabian legends plays nearly the same role as the German Dietrich von Bern. The two-horned refers to the strength of the sun bull. Alexander is often found upon coins with the horns of Jupiter Ammon. It is a question of identification of the ruler around whom so many legends have were clustered with the sun of spring in the sign of the bull and the ram. It is obvious that humanity had a great need of effacing the personal and human from their heroes, so as finally to make them through metastasis or eclipse, the equal of the sun, that is to say completely a libido symbol. If we think, if we thought like Schopenhauer, then we would say, surely say libido symbol, but we thought like Goethe. If we thought we like Goethe, we would say sun, for we exist because the sun sees us. Um, end of footnote, and back to text. Now follows a moral reflection. Then the narrative continues, quote, Then he followed his course further until he came to the place where the sun rises, end quote. If now we wish to know who is the unknown servant of God, we are told in this passage, he is Dal Quirinin Alexander, the sun. He goes to the place of setting, and he goes to the place of rising. The passage also, oh, sorry, the passage about the unknown servant of God is explained by the commentaries in a well-defined legend. The servant is Chidner, the, ve the verdant one, the never-tiring wanderer who roams for hundreds and thousands of years over lands and seas, the teacher and counselor of pious men, the, wa the one wise in divine knowledge, the immortal. The authority of the Taberi associates Chidr with Dalquernem. Chidr, Jidher, is said to have reached the stream of life as a follower of Alexander, and both unwittingly had drunk of it, so they became immortal. Moreover, Chidhir is identified by the old commentaries with Elias, who also did not die, but who was taken to heaven in a fiery chariot. Elias is Helios. Footnote. Here the ascension of Mithra and Christ are closely related. End footnote. It is to be observed that Adhasvara Ad also owes his existence to an obscure place in the holy Christian scriptures. This place is to be found in Matthew 14, 28. First comes the scene where Christ appoints Peter as the rock of his church and nominates him the governor of his power. Footnote, a parallel is found in the Mithra Mysteries. See below. And after that follows the prophecy of his death. And then comes the passage. Verily, I say unto you, there may there be some standing here which will not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. End quote. Here follows the scene of transfiguration. And was transferred before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. Footnote. Parallel to this are the conversations of Muhammad with Elias, at which the sacramental bread was served. In the New Testament, the awkwardness is restricted to the proposal of Peter. This infantile character of such scenes is shown by similar features, thus by the gigantic stature of Elias in the Koran, and also the tales of the commentary in which it is stated that Elias and Cheater met each year in Mecca, conversed, and shaved each other's heads. End of footnote. From these passages, it appears that Christ stands on the same plane as Elias without be, being identified with him. Footnote. On the contrary, according to Matthew 6, 17, 16, 1, 1, John the Baptist is to be understood as Elias. So, although the people considered him as Elias, the ascension takes place Christ as identical Christ as identical with Elias. The prophecy of Christ shows that their exile aside from himself, one or more that 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 their that so the prophecy of Christ shows that there ex there exist aside from himself one or more immortals who shall not die until Parousai. According to John twenty one twenty second verse, the boy John was considered as one of the immortals. And the legend is, 
that he is, in fact, not dead, but merely sleeping in the ground until Taporusi, and breathes so that the dust swirls around his grave. As is evident, there are passable bridges from Christ by way of Elias to Chitter and Ahusurus. It is said in an account of this legend that Dulquernian led his friend Chitter to the source of life in order to have him drink of immortality. Footnote. Another account says that Alexander had been in India on the mountain of Adam with his minister Chitter. End of footnote. Alexander also bathed in the stream of life and performed the ritual ab ab abulations. As I previously mentioned in a footnote, according to Matthew twin, um, 16, sec, 12th verse, John the Baptist is Elias, therefore permanently identical with Chitter. Now, however, it is to be noted that in the Arabian legend, Chitter appears rather as a companion or accompanied Chitter with Dalquernium or with Elias like unto them or identified with them footnote these mythological equations follow absolutely the rule of dreams where the dreamer can be resolved into many analogous forms there are end of footnote there are therefore two similar figures who resemble each other but who nevertheless are distinct the analogous situation in the christian legend is found in the scene by the jordan where john leads christ to the source of life christ is there the subordinate john the superior similar to Dulquernian and Chitter, or Chitter and Moses, and also Elias. The latter relation especially is such that Volers compares Chitter and Elias on the one side with Gilgamesh and his brother Iabani on the other side, with the De Dioscori, one, who is, one of whom is immortal, and the other mortal. This relation is also found in Christ and John the Baptist. Footnote, he must grow, but I must waste away. John 3.30. And on the other hand, and Christ and Peter on the one hand, and Christ and Peter on the other. The last name parallel only finds its explanation through comparison with the Mithric mysteries, where the esoteric contents are revealed to us through monuments. Upon the Mithric marble relief of Kal Gunfert, um, it is represented how a halo with a halo Mithra crowns Helios who neither kneels before him or else who either kneels before him or else floats up to him from below. Mithra is represented on a Mithric monument of Osterbuchen as holding in his right hand the shoulder of a mystic ox above Helios, who stands bowed down before him, the left hand resting on a sword hilt. A crown lies between them on the ground. Kumult observes this scene that is prob that probably represents the divine prototype of the ceremony of the initiation into the degree of miles in which a sword and a crown were conferred upon the mystic. Helios is therefore appointed the miles of Mithra. In a general way, Mithra seems to occupy the role of patron to Helios, which reminds us of the boldness of Hercules towards Helios. Upon his journey towards Girion, Helios bur burns too hotly. Hercules, full of anger, threatens him with his never-failing arrows. Therefore, Helios is compelled to yield and lends to the circle lends to the hero his sunward ship, which he is accustomed to journey across the sea. Thus Hercules returns to Eretheria to the cattle herds of Girnon. Footnote, the parallel between Hercules and Mithra may be drawn even more closely. Like Hercules, Mithra is an excellent archer. Judging from certain monuments, not only the youthful Hercules appeared to be threatened by a snake, but also Mithra as a youth. The meaning of the aflos of Hercules, the work, is the same as the Mithric mystery of the conquering and the sacrifice of the bull. End of footnote. On the monument at Kalgurfurt, Mithra is furthermore representing, press, represented pressing Helios' hand, either in farewell or as a ratification. In a further scene, Mithra mounts the chariot of Helios, either for the ascension of the sea journey. Footnote. These three scenes are represented in a row on the Calfurt monument. Thus, the dramatic connection of these must be surmised. Cumont. Um, and the Fumont. Cumont is of the opinion that Mithra gives to Helios gives Helios a sort of ceremonious investiture and consecrates him with his divine power by crowning him with his own hands. This relation corresponds to that of Christ to Peter. Peter, through his symbol, the cock, has the character of a sun god. After the ascension, or sea journey, 
of Christ, he is a visible pontiff of divinity. He suffers, therefore, the same death, crucifixion, as Christ, and becomes the great Roman deity, sol invictus, the conquering triumphant church itself, embodied in the Pope in the scene of Malchus. He is always shown as the miles of Christ to which the sword is granted, and as the rock upon which the church is founded. The crown, footnote, also the triple crown, is also given to him who passes the power to bind and to set free. Thus Christ, like the sun, is the visible God, whereas the Pope, like the area of the Roman Caesars, is the solus invicti comes. The setting sun appoints a successor whom he invests with the power of the sun. The Christian sequence, John, Christ, Peter, Pope, and the footnote. Duv Quirinum gives Chidher eternal life. Chidher communicates his wisdom to Moses. Footnote, the immortality of Moses is proven by a parallel situation with Ilias in the Transfiguration. There even exists a report according to which the forgetful servant of Joshua drinks from the well of life, whereupon he becomes immortal and is placed in a ship by Chidher and Moses as a punishment and is cast out to sea once more a fragment of a sun myth, the motive of a sea journey. Footnote. See Frobenius. End of footnote. The primitive symbol which designates that portion of the zodiac in which the sun, with the, sun, with the winter solstice, again enters upon the yearly course, is the goat fish sign. The Aixauxiras. The sun mounts like a goat to the highest mountain and later goes into the water as a fish. The fish is the symbol of the child. For the child, before his birth, lives in the water like a fish, and the sun, because it plunges into the sea, becomes equally fish and child. The fish, however, is always a phallic symbol. Footnote. Therefore the fish is the symbol of the Son of God. At the same time, the fish is also the symbol of the approaching world cycle. End of footnote. Also the symbol for the woman. Briefly stated, the fish is a libido symbol, and indeed, as it seems predominantly for the renewal of the libido. The journey of Moses with his servant is a life journey, 80 years. They grow old and lose their life forces, libido. That is, they lose the fish, which, quote, pursues its course into a marvelous manner, in a marvelous manner to the sea, end quote, which means the setting of the sun. When the two novices, when the two notice their loss, they discover at the place where the where the source of life is found, uh, where the dead fish revived and sprang into the sea. Chidher, wrapped in his mantle, but note the amniotic membrane, perhaps, and a footnote, sitting on the ground. According to another version, he sat on an island in the sea, or quote, in the wettest place on earth, unquote. That is, he was just born from the maternal depths. Where the fish vanished, Chidler, the verdant one, was born as son of the deep waters, his head veiled, a kabir, a, pro a proclaimer of divine wisdom. The old Babylonian Onas Ea, who was represented in the form of a fish and daily came from the sea as a fish to teach the people wisdom. Footnote. The Etrurian Tagas, who sprang from the freshly plowed furrow, is also a teacher of wisdom. In the Latiolain myth of the Basotos, there is a description of how a monster devoured all men and left only one woman, who gave birth to a son, the hero, in a stable instead of a cave. See the etymology of this myth. Before she had arranged a bed for the infant out of straw, he was already grown and spoke words of wisdom. The quick growth of a, the hero, a frequently recurring motive, appears to mean that the birth and apparent apparent childhood of the hero is so extraordinary because his birth really means his rebirth. Therefore, he becomes very quickly adept to his hero role. All right, end of footnote. His name was brought into connection with John's. With the arising of the renewal sun, all, the lived, all that lived in darkness, as water, animal, or fish, surrounded by all terrors of night and death, became the shining, fiery firmament of the day. Footnote. Um, regarding death, battle of Ray with a night serpent. End of footnote. Thus the words of John the Baptist gain a special meaning. Quote, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. End of footnote. 
With Volaires, we may also compare Chidder and Elias, Moses, and his servant Joshua, with Gilgamesh and his brother Iabani. Gilgamesh wandered through the world, driven by anxiety and longing to find immortality. His path led him across the seas to the wise Upanitim Noah, who knew how to cross the waters of death. There Gilgamesh had to dive down to the bottom of the sea for the magical herb which, which led him back to the land of men. When he came again to his native land, land, a serpent stole the magic plant from him. The fish again slid into the sea. But on the return from the land of the blessed, of an, immor an immortal mariner accompanied him, who, banished by a curse of Utnapishtim, sorry, that was Utnapishtim, not Upanishad, um, the Noah guy, was forbidden to return to the land of the blessed. Gilgamesh's journey lost its purpose on account of the loss of the magic herb. Instead, he is accompanied by an immortal whose fate, indeed, we cannot learn from the fragments of the epic. This banishment, this banished immortal, is the model for ah, as, ah, ah, Asver, Ahasver, as Jensen aptly remarked. Again we encounter the motive of the Dioscuri, mortal and immortal, setting and rising sun. This motive is also represented, represented as if protected from the hero. The Sacrifium Mithriacum, the sacrifice of the bull, in its religious representation very often flanked by the two Dedo fores, cautis and cautophytes, one with raised, with a raised, and the other with a lowered torch. They represent brothers who re, who reveal their character through the symbol, symbolic position of the torch. Kumat connects them, not without meaning, with the sepulchral erotes, who, as genie with the reverse torches, had traditional meaning. The one is supposed to stand for death; the other for life. I cannot refrain from mentioning the similarity between the Safricium, the Saf Sacrificium Mithricium, where the sacrificed bull in the center is flanked on both sides by Dadofries, to the Christian sacrifice of the lamb or the ram. The crucified is also traditionally flanked by two thieves. Um, by two thieves, one of whom ascends to paradise, the other who descends to hell. Footnote. The difference between this and the Mithra sacrifice seems to be extraordinarily significant. The Dadophoris are harmless gods of light who do not participate in the sacrifice. The animal is lacking in the sacrifice of Christ. Therefore, there are two criminals who suffer the same death. The scene is much more dramatic. The interconnection of the Dadophries to Mithra, of which I will speak later, allows us to assume the same relation of Christ to the criminals. The scene with Barabbas betrays that Christ is the god of the ending year who is represented by one of the thieves, while the one of the coming year is free. End of footnote. The idea of the mortal and the immortal seems to have passed also into the Christian worship. Semitic gods are often represented as flanked by two peridroi. For example, Baal of Edessa, accompanied by Aziz and Monimos. Baal is the sun, accompanied by Mars and Mercury, as expressed in astronomical teachings. According to the Ch Chaldean view, the gods are grouped into triads. In this circle of ideas belongs also the Trinity, the idea of the triune God in which Christ must be considered in his unity with the Father and the Holy Ghost. So too do the thieves belong inwardly to Christ. The two Dadofries are, as Kumont points out, nothing but offshoots from the chief figure of Mithra, and footnote to offshoots. For example, the following dedication is found on the monument D.I.M. Dio Invictio Mithrae Cautopati. One discovers something that Dimitri Kate or Dio Mitre Katopati in a similar alteration as Dio Invincio Mitre or sometimes Dio Invicto or merely Invicto. It also appears that the Dadofries are fitted with knife and bow, the attributes of a Mithra of Mithra. From this it is to be concluded that the three figures represent three different states of a single person. End of footnote. So 
from the chief figure of Mithra to whom belongs a mysterious threefold character. So that sentence says, so the two dad dofries are, as Kumut points out, nothing but offshoots from the chief figure of Mithra, who, to whom belongs a mysterious threefold character. According to an account of Dionysus Aeropagita, the magicians celebrated a festival, Tau Tri Tripla Sion Mithrun, which means of the threefold Mithra. An observation likewise referring to the Trinity is made by Plutarch concerning Ormuds. Tris Iauton Auxisaus Apiste Tau Helio, which means having expanded himself threefold, he departs from the sea. The Trinity, as three different states of the unity, is also a Christian thought. In the very first place, the suggestion, a sun myth. The observation by Macrobius 118 seems to lend support to this idea. So, how autum autaum diversitas ad solum referentur et parvulus vidiatur haimali solstitio qualem Egypti proferant ex adio dae certa, ai quint octio vernali figura eu venias ora, ora onatur posterior statitur aetas ius plunissima effigi barbae solstitio aestivio Exunde per diminutiones volunt volunti sescenti quatra forma deus figur figuratur, which means, now these differences in the season refer to the sun, which seems at the winter solstice an infant, such as the Egyptians on a certain day bring out their sanctuaries. At the vernal equinox, equinox it is represented as a youth, Later, at the summer solstice, its age is represented by the full-grown beard, which, at the last, the god is represented by a gradually diminishing form of an old man. End of translation. As Kumon observes, Cautes and Cautepates occasionally carry in their hands the head of a bull and a scorpion. Footnote. Taurus and Scorpio are the equinoctial signs of the period from 4300 to 2150 BC. These signs, long since superseded, were retained even in the Christian era. End of footnote. Taurus and Scorpio are equinoctial signs, which clearly indicates that the sacrificial scene refers primarily to the sun cycle, the rising sun, which sacrifices itself as the summer at the summer solstice and the setting sun. In the sacrificial scene, the symbol of the rising and setting sun was not equal, easily represented. Therefore, this idea was, was removed from the sacrificial image. We have pointed out above that the Dioscursi represent a similar idea, although in a somewhat different form. The one sun is always mortal, the other immortal. As this entire sun mythology is merely a psycho psychologic projection to the heavens, the fundamental thesis probably is as follows. Just as people consist of a moral and immor immortal, immortal and immortal part, so the sun is a pair of brothers. Footnote. Under some circumstances, it is also sun and moon. One being mortal, the other immortal. This thought lies at the basis of all the theology and of all theology in general, people are indeed mortal, but there are some who are immortal, and there is something in us which is immortal. Thus, the gods, a uh, cheater or Saint Germain, are our immortal part, which, though incomprehensible, dwells among us somewhere. Comparison with the sun teaches us over and over again that the gods are libido. It is that part of us which is immortal, since it represents that bond through which we feel uh, 
that in the race we are never extinguished. This footnote. In order to characterize the individual and the all-soul, the personal and the super-personal Atman, a verse of the Shittavatura Upanishad, Dusen, makes us the following comparison. And then in German, which I won't attempt because I never studied it, so in English, two closely allied friends, beautifully winged, embrace one in the same tree. One of them eats the sweet berries, the other not eating, merely looks downwards. End of footnote. It is life from the life of mankind. Its springs, which well up from the depths of the unconscious, come, as does our life in general, from the root of the whole of humanity, since we are indeed only a twig broken off from the mother and transplanted. Since the divine in us is the libido, footnote, among the elements composing people in the, mid, in the mythic liturgy, liturgy, fire is especially emphasized as a divine element, described as tau eos, imin, krasin, theodari don, the divine gift in my composition. End of footnote. So, since the divine in us is, is the libido, we must not wonder what we what we have taken along with us in our theology, ancient representations from olden times. Oh, sorry, we yeah, must not wonder. So, which gives the tr the triune figure of the God. We have taken the tri pli plats sorry triplacion theon, the threefold God, from the public phallic symbolism the originality of which may well be uncontested. Footnote. It is sufficient to point out the loving interest which people and also God of the Old Testament has for the nature of the penis and how much depends upon it. The male genitals are the basis of this trinity. It is an anatomical fact that one testis, testicle is generally placed somewhat higher than the other, and it also a very old but nevertheless still surviving superstition that one testicle generates a boy and the other a girl. Footnote. The testicles easily count as twins, therefore in vulgar speech the testicles are called Siamese twins. End of footnote. A late Babylonian bas relief from Lajard's footnote, um, Recherche sur la culture, etc. de Venus, quoted by Inman, ancient pagan and modern Christian symbolism. So the late Babylonian Past relief really from Lajard's collection seems to be in accordance with this view. In the middle of the image stands an andro androgynous god, masculine and feminine face. Footnote The androgynous element is not to be undervalued in the face of Adonis, Christ, Dionysus, and Mithra, and hints at the bisexuality of sexuality of the libido. The smooth shaven face and the feminine clothing of the Catholic priests contains a very old feminine constitu constituent from the Attis Sibyl cult. End of footnote. So, the masculine and feminine face upon the right side, the male side, is found a serpent and a sun halo around its head. On the left, the female side, there is also a serpent with a moon above its head. Above the head of the god, there are three stars. These, this ensemble would, would seem to confirm the trinity. Footnote. Stiekel has again and again noted that the trinity is a phallic symbol. So, a trinity of the representation. The sun serpent at the right is male, and just a second. The sun at the right is male, and the serpent at the left side is female, signi signified by the moon. This image possesses a symbolic sexual suffix, which makes the sexual significance of the whole uh, obtrusive. Upon the male side, a rhomb, R H O M B, is found, a favorite symbol of the female genitals. Upon the female side there is a wheel or felly. A wheel always refers to the sun, but the spokes are thickened and enlarged at the ends, which suggests phallic symbolism. It seems to be a phallic wheel, which was not unknown in antiquity. There are obscene bas-reliefs where cupids turn wheels of nothing but phalli. Footnote, sun's rays equal phalli. It is, not only, so end of it is not only the serpent which suggests the phallic significance of the sun. I quote one especially marked case from an abundance of proof. In the antique collection at Verona, I discovered a late Roman mystic inscription in which was are the following representations. So it shows a picture of a sun, a pear with like a, the bottom of it shaped like a bottom, a crescent moon for a, 
um, for a moon that would, would be held in the, in the left hand, so one that's waning. And then a picture of a gourd, looks like a gourd, so it's circular on the bottom, and then it has sort of the, um, you know, the, the top square, and then coming out of that is a straight line with a little circle on top of it, and intersecting it is an H. These symbols are easily read, sun, phallus, moon, vagina, or uterus. This interpretation is confirmed by another figure of the same collection. There, are the, same represent there the same representation is found, only the va vessel, so a footnote, in the Bakiri myth a woman appears who has sprung from the corn mortar. In the Zulu myth it is said, a woman is to catch a drop of blood in a vessel, then close the vessel and put it aside for eight months and open it in the ninth month. She follows this advice, opens the vessel in the ninth month, and finds a child in it. End of footnote. So the impression on the, um, so the same reposition is found only on the vessel, is replaced by the figure of a woman. The impression on the coins, where in the middle of the palm is seen encoiled by a snake, flanked by two stones, testicles, or else in the middle a stone, a, in the middle a stone encircled by a snake, to the right a palm to the left a shell, female genitals, um, should be interpreted in a similar manner. In Lajard's Recherche, the cult of Venus, there is a coin of Perga, where Artemis of Perga is represented by a conical stone phallic flanked by a man claimed to be men, and by a female figure claimed to be Artemis. Men, the soul called Lunus, is found upon an attic bas-relief, apparently with a spear, but fundamentally a scepter with phallic significance, flanked by Pan with a club, a phallus, and a female figure. Footnote. Um, oh, no, it's just Rocher lexicon, so end of footnote. The traditional representation of the crucified flanked by John and Mary is closely associated with this circle of ideas, precisely as it is the crucified with, is, as is the crucified with the thieves. From this we see how, beside the sun, there emerges again and again the much more primitive comparison of the libido with the phallus. And a special trace still deserves mention here. The Dadorfi Kautafetes, who represent Mithra, is also represented with the cock, footnote, like Mithra and Dadorfi's, and the pineapple. But these are the attributes of the Figarian God, God, men, whose cult was widely diver, diffused. Men, men was represented with Peleus, um, the pineapple. Whoops, sorry. Men was represented with Peleus, the pineapple and the cock, also in the form of a boy, just as the Dadofres are boyish figures. This last name property relates them with the men to the Kabiri. Men has a very close connection with Attis, the son and the lover of Sibyl. In the same time of the Roman Caesars, men and Attis were entirely identified as stated above. Attis, who wears the, also wears the Peleus like men, Mithra, and Dadophores. As the son and lover of his mother, he again leads us to the source of this religion-creating incest libido, namely to the mother. Incest leads logically to the ceremonial castration in the Attic Sibylline, Sibyl cult, for the hero, driven insane by his mother, mutilates himself. Footnote. The castration in the service of the mother explains this quotation in a very significant matter from Exodus 4.25. Zen Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off her son's foreskin and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband thou art to be to me. This passage shows what circumcision means. End of footnote. I must at present forego entering more deeply into this matter because the incest problem is to be discussed at the close. Let this suggestion suffice that from the from different directions the anal analysis of the libido symbolism always leads back again to the mother incest. Therefore, we may sur surmise that the lodging of the libido raises to God repressed in the, into the unconscious, is a primitive, incestuous one which concerns the mother. Though renouncing the virility of the first beloved, the mother, 
or sorry, through renouncing the virility of the first beloved, the mother, the feminine element, becomes extremely predominant, hence the strongly androgynous character of the dying and resurrected redeemer. That heroes are nearly always a wanderer, footnote Gilgamesh, Dionysus, Hercules, Christ, Mithra, and so on, so that, the, that heroes are nearly always wanderers is a psychologically clear symbolism. The wandering is a representation of the longing, Footnote, compare this with Graf R. Wagner, oh, what, in German, end of footnote. So, is a representation of the longing of the ever restless desire which nowhere finds its object, for unknown to itself it seeks the lost mother. The wandering association renders the sun comparison easily intelligible. Also, under this aspect, the hero always resembles, resemble Heroes always resemble the wandering sun, which seems to justify the fact that the myth of the hero is a sun myth. But the myth of the hero, however, is, as it appear, appears to me, the myth of our own suffering unconscious, which has an unquenchable longing for all the deepest sorrows, sources of our own being, for the body of the mother, and through it, for communion with infinite life in the countless forms of existence. Here I must introduce the words of the master who has divided the deepest roots of Faustian longings. Unwilling, I reveal a loftier mystery. In solitude are thrones, throned the goddesses, no space around them. Peace and time still less, only to speak of them embarrasses. They are the mothers. Goddesses unknown to ye, the mortals named by us willingly. Delve in the deepest depths, must thou to reach them. Tis thine own fault that we hoped for help beseech them. Where is the way? No way to the unreachable, never to be trodden, a way to the unbeseechable, never to be besought. Art thou prepared? There are no locks, no latches to be lifted. Through endless solitudes shalt thou be drifted. Hast thou through solitudes and deserts dared, and hast thou swum to furthest verge of ocean, and there the boundless space beheld? Still hast thou seen wave after wave in motion, even though impending doom thy fear compelled. Thou hast seen something in the barrel dim of peace lulled seas, the sport of dolphins swim. Hast thou seen the flying clouds, sun, moon, and star? Not shalt thou see in endless void afar. Not hear thy footstep fall, nor meet a stable spot to rest thy feet. Here, take this key. The key will scent the pure place from all others. Follow it down to a lead there to the mothers. Descend then. I could also say, ascend, to where all the same escape from the created, to shapeless forms in liberated spaces. Enjoy what long ere was disp dissipated. There whirls the press like clouds on clouds unfolding. Then... With stretched arms swing high the key thou art holding. At last a blazed tripod tells thee this, that there the utterly deepest bottom is. Now footnote to tripod. I have pointed out above in reference to the Zosimus vision that the altar meant the uterus corresponding to the baptismal font. So I'll start again. At last a blazed tripod tells thee this, that there the utterly deepest bottom is. Its light to thee will then the mothers show, some in their seats and others stand or go, as their own will, formation, transformation, the eternal mind's eternal recreation, forms of all creatures. There with floating free they'll see thee, thee not, for only wraiths they see, so pluck up heart, the danger then is great. Go to the tripod ere thou hesitate, and touch it with the key. That's the end of this chapter. Reader's commentary. So it took me a long time to read this chapter, and so I got to sort of digest what libido is, and um, sort of thinking about you know libido more um, more widely. So you know bigger perspective, and just sort of looking at the idea of libido as a life force, which was nice to just you know, walk around the house doing daily things or whatever and just sort of think about, well, this is life force that's, you know, walking from the hall into the bedroom to make the bed or whatever. Um, the other thing that um, I thought was interesting about this is it feels a little bit like 
Jung is sort of grappling with with Freud's concept of you know everything really like you know that joke um, a Freudian slip is when you said one thing but you meant your mother so it's kind of grappling with with all of that and the whole thing of like the whole phallic thing so I feel like there's a little bit of nearsightedness and just sort of seeing everything as phallic and not seeing that it can be both because a lot of the particularly really ancient symbolism is as much I think about the female as it is about the male um, so you know you, it's like you kind of see what you want to see I think that if, if he had were to do this book again when he was later in his life there probably would have been a little bit more of a rounded view of things but he does have you know he does bring things around sort of snake eating its tail type around um, so I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.